Hi everyone, thanks for listening to my presentations. Today I'll be talking about upper gastrointestinal tract bleeding in children. That is, hematemesis in children. Okay, let's go. When we're dealing with hematemesis in children, well, probably in adults as well, we should ascertain that is this truly vomiting of blood or not? That is, I wish you sure this is not hemoptysis and was swallowed and now vomiting the blood. So, we should also make sure that is this not epistasis? So, three things now. Is it truly hematemesis? That is, is this child actually vomiting blood and the blood is not from hemoptysis? That is, covering up blood and then swallowing it, now vomiting it back, okay? Or are we dealing with epistasis, a free child in nostrils? That's the beginning of the journey. Okay, if we are sure that it is truly hematemesis, then we need to flash back on our anatomy that this is from upper gastrointestinal tract. And upper gastrointestinal tract means anything above the ligament of trees, such as the upper part of the duodenum. Remember, duodenum has four parts, right? The first two parts up and the last two parts down. And of course, the duodenum upper part, the stomach, the esophagus, with or without the mouth being included. Okay, in neonates, now we are sure this is hematemesis, but we are dealing with a child born from the first hour to the first 28 days of life. It might be as a result of maternal blood being swallowed during childbirth or vitamin K deficiency or hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Or we're dealing with stress ulcer or stress gastritis. Disease esophagitis or nasogastric tube trauma during resuscitation in the delivery room. And we're dealing with vascular anomalies somewhere or gastrointestinal duplications. Is this a result of sepsis? or coagulopathy of you know, any cause, including sepsis. Are we dealing with mink protein intolerance or congenital coagulation defect? That is in neonates. Okay, what if this is an infant? Are we dealing with gastritis or gastric ulcer here? Is this acid peptic or the disease or malaria waste here? Is this a vaginitis or vascular anomaly somewhere? Any gastrointestinal duplication or gastric viruses, including also vagal viruses? Are we having duodenal webs or intestinal obstruction? If this is adolescent, you know, they are no older now, are we having malaria waste here? Any trouble meeting here before having the, the Hematemesis, okay? Acid peptic disease, gastric viruses, osvagia viruses, osvagitis, is this for anybody? Any caustic injection, maybe you know, perhaps suicide, hmm, or suicide attempt, or vasculitis, for example, endoscolium purpura. Is this person already diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease before Crohn's? Any bowel absorption? Or am I dealing with the Lafoy lesion. That is a kind of large tortuous arterial in stomach or any parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Or am I dealing with hemobilia? Don't worry about my spelling here. That is for you know, British English. American English is H E M O B I I L I A. And that is traumatic cause of hemorrhage from the biliary tree particularly after a medical procedure, okay? So, we need to rule out the cause. Okay, certain circumstances 
will lead to some probable diagnosis. For example, if it is sudden and massive, then we'll be thinking about vascular bed problem or arterial bleed. But if the history revealed that there was vomiting before hematemesis, then we should be thinking about malory waste here, osophagitis or gastritis. Still on certain circumstances, if banana stool, that is black stool or dark red, that is mostly from moderate or bricks upper GI bleeding. But if it is matochisia, that is bright red blood in stool, you should be thinking about lower gastrointestinal, bricks upper gastrointestinal bleed, infants with upper gastrointestinal bleed, but because they have shorter transit time. So the gas, gastric emptying is faster in them. Still, under certain circumstances, if there is epigastric pain or heartburn, and now hematemesis, we should be thinking of peptic ulcer disease, osophagitis, gastritis, eosinophilic esophagitis, and peel esophagitis. If the child is vomiting and having feeling intolerance, should be thinking about peptic ulcer disease or food allergy. If we are dealing with odinophagia, that is painful swallowing, then we should rule out peel esophagitis, foreign body, candidiasis, cytomegalovirus, every simple virus also vagitis. And if you are thinking or oh, we've seen jaundice, then we should check out for liver disease. If we are battling with epistasis and now hematemesis, we should rule out bleeding dyscrasia and of course nasopharynx aspirate. If we could pick easy bruising or bleeding in other parts of the body, then we should rule out bleeding dyscrasia, liver disease, von Willebrand disease, and vitamin K deficiency. If this is a child that is bedridden or critically ill, then we should be thinking, could this be as a result of our intervention using as a gastric tube or endotrica intubation, or we are dealing with ulcer already. If this is due to medication, then which one? Is this tetracycline? Maybe used for acne treatment in adolescents? Not steroid anti inflammatory drugs like phosphonase or pale osophagitis. If the history of choking is present, then are we dealing with foreign body? If alcohol ingestion is part of the history, is this gastritis or osophagitis? If we could pick that the child is having severe cough, then this could be hemoptysis, and then it was swallowed, and now the swallowed content of the uh, of the Sputum with blood that is hemoptysis is now being vomited. Okay, investigations. We have to get complete blood count. Although we might not know the true value of the PCV when the bleeding is recent, okay, when it's within hours. No, we're not going to get the true picture yet. We have to group and cross match because we might have to transfuse. And if it, if it is massive, and we need to transfuse immediately, and grouping and cross match might delay, then we can give O negative, particularly to the females, okay? And electrolytes, blood-related nitrogen, creatinine, should be acid.
PT or INR and APTT to know what is happening to the coagulative pathway, particularly the liver. And EKG in other case, no barium swallow. Same on investigation. We can do esophageal gastroduodenoscopy and test for H. pylori. You can check my channel for H. pylori testing. That was published recently. So if you want to have H. pylori testing, you can have serology done, but that may not be helpful, particularly in individuals who have been treated and successfully eradicated. The value could still be high if you choose the serology. But if you have endoscopy with biopsy, that is the gold standard. Real best blood test is very good, and then that is very sensitive and specific, but is not available in every part of the world. Stool antigen will be nice when it comes to H. pylori, but the situation must be active because you need you know, the antigen in the stool. Then you have to check stool for melena or hematochesia, that is frank blood in stool. Then you check your urea to creatinine ratio, which will be greater than 0.12. When it comes to treatment, this is going to be an emergency, right? Admit. Check the airway and clear the airway of any foreign body, any secretion, such as it is appropriate. And the tracker intubation as is appropriate. Get the O2 set and give oxygen as it is appropriate. Breathing, check for the chest region, any deformity, per cause. Palpate, oscotate, can the respiratory rate, check central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis, the circulatory system, what is the blood pressure, what is the heart rate, any dehydration here, give IV fluid, two large IV lines, normal saline first, later on half saline with D5 for maintenance, Foley's catheter, no NG tube here because we are dealing with hematemesis. No NG tube in hematemesis. If you are dealing with black stool or hematochesia, you can give NG tube. You can pass NG tube. Still on treatment, transfuse if hemoglobin is less than 70 gram per liter. You can use erythromycin intravenously to clear blood before you embark on endoscopy to get a better picture. And after then, you can embark on EGD. You can use proton pump inhibitor, example, pantoprazole intravenously, and stop any offending drug or drugs. For other case, you can use EKG. And if you have peaked H. pylori, you can treat appropriately using triple regimen or quadruple regimen. You can check my channel for the treatment because it's not one medication that we use to treat H. pylori. You might use amoxicillin and clarithromycin with proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole, or you may use quadruple. You now, just check my channel. You can give octreotide, isoprazine, band ligation. Balloon and transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt could be embargo upon. Sclerotherapy, fresh frozen plasma, clotting factor concentrate, and platelet transfusion if less than 50 times 10 raised to power 9 per liter. Still on treatment, if through endoscopy, like osophageal gastroduodenoscopy reveals a bleeding source, then embark on the following. That is endoscopic hematostatic treatment. A coaptive thermal coagulation, 
We tell him mail of one in ten thousand or one in twenty thousand epinephrine in selling, and also mechanically binding hemoclip staples or suture. But if A to C should fail, then embark on surgery. Still on treatment, can also use H2 receptor antagonists. You can use Cavadilol to reduce hepatic vein pressure. If there's liver pathology, for example, liver cirrhosis, you can use nofloxacin, keftriazone, and if you are using vasopressin with vasoconstriction in myocardial infected patients, please use nitroglycerin to help dilate. Do you know why, or someone will want to ask me why antibiotics here? That is nofloxacin and keftriazone. It's because liver cirrhosis can tilt to spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And having your antibiotics ready will help. You can choose from pantoprazole, 80 mg start, given over 10 hours. Then, 8 mg per hour infusion for 72 hours. You can go for ototrine, 50 microgram in 100 means normal setting. Then, 25 microgram per hour infusion for the next two days. As a matter of fact, you can check my channel for a full presentation on octotide. You can also choose from vasopressin. Vasopressin is having a kind of interesting definition. 20 units in 20 mils for 20 minutes. Again, I read here. Vasopressin, 20 units in 20 minutes of D5 for 20 minutes, so 20, 20, 20. For viruses of Osovegus, use ototype. But if non-varicea, use pantoprazole. Finally, close monitoring of vital signs and the pattern of bleeding will be essential. And we cannot draw the curtain without taking complete and full history. And of course, also history of bleeding anywhere else in the body. And of course, family history. For example, if this is bleeding dyscrasia and you are thinking of von Willebrand disease, we need family history. And with that, I've come to the end of this presentation. Remember to share and subscribe or leave comments. I appreciate it.